Welcome to the Adroit Artist. My name is Andre Cormier. I'm the executive director of Mount Blue TV, and I'm your host for this episode. And today we're uh, happy to be joined by three artists who are proud of a local exhibit called The Art Among Us 2. And if you could introduce yourselves. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Frank Chin, um, local artist here. Hello, I'm Lise Reagan, and I live in Anson, and I'm pleased to be part of the exhibit. I'm Doug Rawlings, I live in Chesterville, and I'm also very pleased to be part of this. How did you first hear about this or get interested in being a part of this uh, project? Well, I think uh, um, Elaine, Elaine and um, Eileen Kreutz. Eileen, Eileen was the one that, that was spearheading the idea of, uh, she knew many of us are as artists also, and uh, with a committee they talked about it and Peter Mullen who was the president said it was a wonderful idea and uh, contacted uh, via email and, and wanted to know how many would be interested just to get an idea. Um, she got a slew of people uh, not just visual artists, but uh, musicians, poets, and so on. So um, that's how it got started. Yeah, and I think uh, it's Phil Poirier had been in here before, and, and you know he had mentioned that it was one of the bigger events that Emory had seen in terms of people coming in and seeing exhibits. And this is the second one, isn't it, it's Frank? The second Were one. you part of the first one as I well? I was part of the first one, and mm -hmm. Phil was uh, instrumental in setting a lot of the stuff up. Uh, he, as a visual artist also and a photographer, uh, had a good eye for uh, where to hang it up and everything and uh, was instrumental in the second one too. So yes, uh, uh, I was more uh, hands-on the first time. Uh, second time, they're more experienced, so they didn't even need me. <laughs> 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 so had the experience How fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said I could sign up then, but, you know. Well, I loved one of, our, one of the evenings we had when we invited the public in. Uh, virtually everybody who was there, all the artists, said, I'm not an artist, really. I'm just, you know, I really kind of do this on the side, you know. But, the artwork is fantastic. It is I didn't just say that. Amazing stuff. <laughs> you didn't say <laughs> that. You, you <laughs> deny. You yeah. deny yeah. that, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I may have been one of those people. I wasn't part of the last exhibit, um, but this one I heard about it, and I hesitated to get involved because I thought, you know, I'm not a professional artist. I just started painting a few years ago, but I thought, boy, it would be fun to have my art in an exhibit and especially a local exhibit where there's community and to meet some yeah. fellow artists. That was for me a very important because we're kind of new to the area. So I wanted to meet some fellow artists. And um, so it took me a long time to submit. I think I got in just under the wire <laughs> in terms of submitting my work. And I was like, Eileen, can you still take it? <laughs> and she was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. So Yeah, it was well organized. And very well was, organized. Uh, more organized this time because they're more experienced. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing is, is everything is online, which is great. And, and submitting everything, uh, it just went very, very smoothly. Yeah. And a sense of community. I mean, we we gather the opening. There were so many people that I haven't seen in a long time, and mm. then there's new people, and then they always ask about, you know, the artwork and the technique and your inspiration. It's just wonderful to to see that happening again. So mm. it's a yeah. it's a wonderful way to express yourself, and then plus uh, have the community draw together. I'm not an artist. People are hesitant. To, it almost feels, I think, feel, people feel pretentious when they say, right. I'm an artist. Right. right. Um, I'm a composer. But really, people who make art, there's the professional aspect, but also um, it means a lot of different things for, for people that um, making art. Um, Frank, how did you come to, to making art initially? Uh, it started when I was very young. I saw my aunts, uncles, and the whole family drawer um, when we, of course, we owned a restaurant. And in, our, in their spare time, they would draw and doodle. And I oh. saw that. And I said, this is great. And so they showed me how to do this and showed me how to do that. And that's how I got started. You know, uh, it, was in, it was a family. Everybody, most of our, our, our aunts and uncles drew. 
Nice. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So it was a family affair, and that's, that's how I started. And then I branched out. I wanted to go to uh, school for it. Um, I know that I excelled in high school, which you know, when you excel in elementary and high school, you know, you just want to do continue that. And a lot of my teachers thank, you know, thank God for them. They they encouraged me to to go on to bigger and better things and. Um, went from high school to winning a scholarship at the Museum School of Fine Arts, and then I, several years there, graduated and exhibited, was in the Boston scene. I was young, and I, I made some money, and then, uh, you know, I, I graduated from there to Maine, and uh, because I didn't want to hustle and bustle, and Eventually, I got my master's at Rhode Island School of Design, exhibited there, and decided that I'll exhibit in Maine, and that's what I did. Hmm. I usually exhibited in Rockland uh, because that's where I taught, uh, art, you know, adult art classes there mm -hmm. at the Fonsworth, mm -hmm. and then I taught at the Portland Museum of Art in Art Trek in the summer. So I had a beautiful outlet of all the galleries that, mm -hmm. that exhibited there. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, eventually when I retired, I decided that that was a lot of work <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of the things that they wanted was uh, certain aspects. Like I, I, we want landscape that's more realistic. We want this to be mm -hmm. a little more abstract. I like the color of the frame better and, and so on. So I decided that I'll just do it for my own. Mm -hmm. And um, I taught that. Uh, in my regular special art classes, and the kids were really influenced about the printmaking because I'm a printmaker yeah. and a watercolor artist and acrylic artist. So here I am. When you create things, there's often um, an insecurity for people to present or to feel, geez, am, am I an artist? Am I making something that's worthwhile? So along that journey, it sounds like you had some mentors that yeah. and people, that, but for yourself as a personal journey with that, how did you deal with that aspect of it, that having the confidence to say, no, I'm, like you're saying, uh, you get to a point where, no, I don't want somebody to tell me how to, this is my art. Well, when you're at 75 years old, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, it's a little easier to say, hey, listen, I'm all right. <laughs> There's no way you're going to teach me anything. It took me a few years, yeah, huh? it, took, it took me a long time. I'm not going um, back for it. Yeah. You know, the best thing about it was teaching the art. Um, the students, I feed off of the students. Mm -hmm. for, I was a, a teacher in elementary school for uh, 25 years, first through sixth grade, first through sixth grade, uh, schlepping my art supplies because I was an itinerant teacher. Yeah. And uh, the students, the young students there were so enthusiastic about, um, you know, making art that it really instilled art in me. And I mm -hmm. took a lot of ideas from them. Mm -hmm. Like Picasso takes ideas from mm -hmm. young kids mm -hmm. and because of their innocence, I do the same thing. So mm -hmm. um, when we go out to sketch or when we see slides, they have their own vision. I said, wow, this is great. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and one of the best examples when I started teaching is this uh, first grade, beautiful landscape of the park and the, and the family. <laughs> and, and the next thing I know, he comes, I come back and the color was gone, it's, it's all black. I said, what happened, Joel? Said, Mr. Chin, it's nighttime. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's, that's great. wonderful. <laughs> okay. That's wonderful. <laughs> that, so with them, the innocence and the idea of expressing themselves for their own and then sharing with others if they want it is, is, is what I learned. I mean, I... I would love to share the work, but you know, it's my own, and if they like it, that's great. If I know what's behind it, so if they want to ask, you know, if it's nighttime and I want to paint it black, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like Mick Jagger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Lise, how did you get started with, with art? You said you just picked a painting uh, not too long ago. Probably but... six, seven years ago. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I'm a I'm a, or have been, a left brain person all my life. That is, I was a very successful business owner. I founded my own business um, many, many years ago and did well at that and was always very, you know, organized and logical in my, in my thinking, left brain. 
Um, but I was also a person who loved to be creative. Uh, I, in my work, I was always thinking about creativity. So a few years ago, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I said, you know, I'd really like to do some painting, but I'm afraid to do it because I'm so left brain that I'm going to judge myself all the time. I'm going to put a line on the paper and go, no, wrong, wrong line. And, you know, so I heard about a class that was being held. This, we lived down in Massachusetts at the time. It was meditation. You meditate and then you go and you paint. Wow. And so I bought some acrylic paints and I brought them to this class and I did this meditation. This teacher had been an art teacher for many years and this was her technique. And um, I meditated and out of that meditation came my first painting, which is Turquoise Storm, nice. the one that's actually in the show. That was literally the first painting <laughs> I ever did. And people say to me, wow, it's so good. I'm like, no, it just, <laughs> it just totally came out of my soul. I can honestly say that. It came, and it wasn't something I judged. I just picked up a, you know, a brush and dipped it in the paint that felt right and started. And I knew that I had to do abstract yeah. art because I had been such a left brain person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that if I did realistic art, it would be hard for me. So from the beginning, I knew it had to be abstract, but also I knew it was going to be abstract impressionism because mm -hmm. I am, my favorite art is impressionism, and I love those colors. My home is decorated that way. I dress that way. <laughs> so that's what we ended up with. That's awesome. <laughs> so. yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's yeah, and I wonder, you know, Frank, you were talking about when you were young, you painted and you drew and you got some good feedback, yeah, which yeah, is what kept you going, yeah. Yeah. right? And um, I was always afraid when I was young to do anything. I was creative and I did things, but I was always afraid of the feedback. Yeah. Now I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, <laughs> ah. <laughs> if people like it, that would be wonderful. And that makes me very happy. But if they don't, it's okay, because it makes me feel okay to do it. You know? I think so. it's an important aspect of, of sharing when, when you make something. It reminds me of, I attended UMF in a creative writing program as somebody that in their late 30s with people that were 19. Oh, wow. To do a writing workshop, everybody in there was like, no, I don't want to share. And I was like, I need, I need feedback. Mm -hmm. Tell me if this yeah. is good or not. Mm -hmm. Doug, Doug you, your mediums you've worked in, I know previously working with you as a, as a writer, Mm. poet. Um, but you, where's art come in for your life? When did you find that you were gravitating towards some of these different mediums? Uh, I, I could piggyback on what, what you guys just said. Um, not to politicize this whole thing, but I'll say it anyways. You know, I, I was an economics major and working on my MBA at Ohio State University when I got drafted into the military and then sent to Vietnam. And when I returned from the war, I was totally confused. I, had, I thought I was going to be an executive at Eastman Kodak. My father worked at Kodak. That's where I was going. Mm. Um, and so uh, Judy and I moved up to Boston. We didn't know anybody in Boston. And I, I got a job in a pharma pharmacy hospital counting out pills. I was just so... <laughs> and I literally, this really honestly got happened. I wandered into a bookstore in Harvard Square <laughs> about midnight. <laughs> just looking around, I picked up this book, Denise Levertov, a poet writing about uh, being a peace activist who went to North Vietnam and her poems about that whole experience, it just blew me away. I said, oh my God. You know, and, I, and, I, and I, you know, talking about professional amateur, I love the idea that amateur comes from the word love, right? Mm -hmm. You love something, mm -hmm. right? You're not, I'm not trying I to make that. money out of anything. I'm just trying. And it, this was a means for me to start making sense of this crazy thing that I went through, right? And so mm -hmm. I started doing, writing these poems for myself, whatever, you know. And then, um, this was of course before social media, right? We're talking about the 70s here, right? <laughs> and for somehow, I don't know how I found out, but there, I found out these guys, uh, Vietnam veterans in Philadelphia, were putting together an anthology of Vietnam veterans poets. So I said, what the heck? You know, so I sent them eight poems, just thinking they're gonna blow me off. Mm. They put every one of them in the book. Wow. Right? Oh, wow. And it said to me, okay, so, 
this works. And I, and I like the idea, you know, I talk to people about writing. I say, don't say it's good or bad. Does it work for me or not, yeah. right? You know, if it doesn't work for you, fine, okay? It might work for somebody else. But, you know. yeah. So this started working for mm. them. So that's one element. The other thing I, I, I'd really like to jump on what Frank had said about uh, working with children. Right? Yeah. When I had my own mm. kids, I mean, literally, wa walking down this country road with a three-year-old, <laughs> Right, I stop getting out of my own head and just watch, you yeah. know. And they stop and they'll look at a blade of gla grass or they'll look at a birch bark wavering. Yeah. Paint. Oh, that's it. Yeah. That's it. Right. I that's mean, that's it. that's where it comes from. Yeah. So I, you know, I was uh, reading children's poems to my kids. A. A. Milne. I love A. A. Milne. So I started writing some children's poems mm -hmm. and I had the, the war poems. And I started looking at political poetry, and just went through that whole that whole experience. I got into this show because of Eileen Kreutz, right? I'd written a poem called Impermanence about Rita Kimber, our good friend Rita Kimber who had died. Um, and literally the day of her memorial service, um, I was at my house and I just had to, I wanted to write something. So I wrote this poem, right? And pretty much right there um, hmm. about Rita, you know, and about, about all of us, you know, facing death and stuff like that. And uh, Eileen said, I really like that poem. I said, oh, thanks, right? And in the poem, it, it, the major element of it is this icicle. And so what Eileen Kreutz did was she did a stained glass yeah. thing of an mm, icicle. It's beautiful. Right. It's a beautiful thing, yeah. right? Yeah. And she said, Doug, I want to put this in, in the show with your with poem. Your poem. <laughs> yeah. So sure. perfect. Thank you so much, right? Yeah. It's this whole notion of art, I think, and community. I mean, we're feeding off of each other. You know, I, I'm feeding off this. She's feeding off that. We're working yeah. together. We're getting ideas from each other. And it's just... And, and what, what, I, what I liked about my idols are the beat poets, the Allen Ginsbergs and the Diane Winkowskis and, and them, because they never competed against each other. They worked together. Mm. They went to each other's readings. They supported each other. You know, mm. they didn't try to outdo each other. And, that, and I thought, that's the way, that's an artist community. That's the way an artist community really should be. And that's what I think we found yeah. here. My name is Phil Poirier, and I'm the president of uh, Gold Leaf. I'm Eileen Kreutz. I headed up this committee just for the art show, but I've been a Gold Leaf Institute lifelong learning member for a long time. Hi, I'm Joe Terranova, and I'm the vice president of Gold Leaf. There are six of us that formed the art show committee. We started, actually, before 2020. This show was going to go up in 2020, but guess what hit? And so, we postponed, and now the timing's excellent today. What's great about it is that I, pretty, I think all of the artists that are showing are amateurs, and a lot of them have never really showed before, except for the last show we had here. So it's exciting to see the community come out for them, they, and they're drawing the community in, and it's a goodwill, good faith, good, good feeling all the way around, I think, right? Yeah. All of these artists, we found them in these hills, and they have joined Gold Leaf for the spring term, and our hope is that they will be doing projects and classes with us going forward. Betty Jesperson. I live in Farmington and I have a piece in the show um, 
it's a mobile. Uh, I've also been a member of Gold Leaf for many years, and uh, it's a great program because it brings wonderful pro opportunities for senior citizens um, to get involved with the community in all sorts of ways. So we learn a lot, and uh, this is just the, sec the second time we've had an art show, so it's really been um, very exciting that we're doing it again. Hi, uh, my name is Liz Hunt. I live in Temple, and I joined uh, Gold Leaf in 2020. And it really saved me during COVID. I had just moved here and I didn't know anybody. Well, I only knew a few people. So I did some online classes with the Gold Leaf and they still are doing online classes, which are, are great, but some are in person. And um, it's a great program for 50 and older. Mm -hmm. um, and I it joined the committee for the art group and it's been a great experience curating the show and meeting all the artists. With COVID and the isolation, of course, I, I was just so relieved that there was something we could do on Zoom that brought us together. And um, Zoom was just a lifesaver for many, many people. And, um, and now we're doing in-person in gatherings and classes. And uh, it's really just having that energy from real people has just been great. So I, I think we're going to stick around and the fact that UMF has taken over the um, operation, the management of the uh, administration, it's really helped a lot. So, I have some art, acrylic artwork, three paintings that I, that I dared to put up. <laughs> uh, but it's been a comfortable group to join. Yeah, I've been making mobiles using driftwood and, um, st you know, wood I find and stone, you know, stones and uh, shells and I've gotten um, it just is a great outlet My name is Mark Stofan, and I'm the treasurer of Gold Leaf, which is a wonderful organization, and I'm very glad that we've had such a huge turnout tonight. And we have a lot of talent of people demonstrating their artistry, and the only requirement, I'm afraid you guys would not qualify, because you have to be over 50, but if you're over 50, you may want to check into Gold Leaf, and we have our summer courses going on. So I have three, I have two large ones there. One is uh, a mountain forest and the other one is fireworks. I like to take the picture and then convert it to a digital canvas. And I also have one at Bar Harbor. Uh, I think it's near the Jordan Pond House. The Bubbles Mountains is in the background, but it's fun. 
Uh, well, it's nice to be outdoors, like nature. Most people like it. And I like using the computer to post-process it to add a little extra to it. Uh, there's a lot of tricks you can do with post-processing to uh, enhance it and to cover your mistakes. It's a lot easier to erase things digitally, not to give away all my trade secrets, but uh, the erase button works very well on the digital world. But it's fun, and uh, it's a good turnout, and it's been a fun night. I'm Lynn Terranova. I live in Chesterville. I'm a fiber artist. I have been doing work with fiber for, for many, many years. I have two pieces in the show. One is a cruel work of a cat in a window, and the other is a needlepoint of a um, seaside village with the underwater harbor. I enjoy doing cruel counted cross stitch. We also work with wool and uh, anything to do with fiber I'm interested in doing. I started oh well into my teens with um, needle based uh, art and then evolved as we got into sheep into the wool aspect of the spinning, the weaving, the knitting and creating through that, some felting, and enjoy doing it all. I like the tactile uh, aspect of it, and in the beginning it was my quiet place from lots of little children running around that I could have time for myself.
if you never share, you, you lose the opportunity to have that connection, right? That's and so, so many of us are, are so caught up in, in well, what are people going to think of this? Right. You never find out what they think no, about it. It's, it's a form of communication, right? Yeah. I mean, how it often is. do you? I mean, I, I'll write a poem. I'll just put it out there. What the heck? You know, Facebook. I do Facebook. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I do. You know, <laughs> and, and I'll get people, you know, sharing, you know, what happened in their lives. Some, some through poetry, some other thing. But it sort of creates this communication. We're not talking about is this a good poem or not that kind of stuff. No, it's just this is another means of us. Absolutely. Expressing, kind of expressing. You know, it's interesting because I said that I do this abstract work and um, it's been really interesting to have people look at my work at the show and I would say what do you see mm -hmm. in it and you get everybody who <laughs> looks at it sees something, something different, different yeah. it's like oh I absolutely see um, right. you know a uh, a person I see a person I see a dove I see a I see a heart I see you know, and and it's um, so fascinating because it really, uh, like you said, it's it it's it comes out in the person who reads it or mm -hmm. who looks at it. Mm -hmm. Comes from. And there are spaces in all of our work, right? That people can fit mm. themselves into into those spaces. That's exactly. why it's done that way. You have your own understanding of your work, but then to have that experience of other people tell yeah. you what they Rediscover think about rediscovering that. Rediscovering your work. Yeah. 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 It's a little bit of yeah. feedback loop. What's, what's that like for you, Frank? When, when, well, um, I, I do both realistic, semi-abstract, and abstract. And if I wanted people to, <laughs> to look at a painting like my landscapes uh, in watercolors, like in Rockland, uh, if I do uh, you know, a boat uh, in a reflection, it's my interpretation of it. But they know it's a boat. Right. Mm -hmm. As far as a semi-abstract, uh, it's viewed as interpretation. But even if they're realistic, they have their own interpretation, the time of day, the mood it sets, and so on. So the color uh, sets the mood. Mine was mostly ultramarine and some, and some, some uh, academy in red in the sunset. So it gives them a warm feeling. Mm -hmm. It gives me a warm feeling, and, and hopefully it evokes that the same with them. Mm -hmm. But as far as uh, semi-abstract and abstract, it's, it's like yours. It's, it's, their interpretation, they can interpret it any way they mm -hmm. want to. Um, several pieces that I have is semi-abstract. You know, you can see that it's a horse, but it's an abstract form. Uh, you can mm -hmm. see a dancer, uh, which is influenced by my family and, and my son dancing um, and nature. Um, and they have a different interpretation, which is great. Mm -hmm. So abs abstract, semi-abstract, and realistic. It's, it's a matter of expression, and I believe that uh, people that are open about it because you have to pry, you know, like my, my, my <laughs> students, I would show them my work and I said, geez, Mr. Chin, I can think I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I said, well, that's what I want you to do. You know, you are just that. as good. And it's these elementary kids that are just wonderful oh. of their innocence. And they take and we feed back each other, and, and, and that's a wonderful expression because mm -hmm. they, they have so much confidence in themselves because everybody, th some of the students, um, my special needs students, would come to me and they says, all I want to do is color. I say, you do colors. Right. You know, there's nothing right or wrong about it. Just do colors. And, and you know, they, they, I remember one middle school student so would uh, come in, and the first thing they do is she sits in her own space. She has her own space. And I would set up an easel and all the colors that she wanted. And she just sat down and look out the window and see the day and then paint that day. Art is an expression and an outlet to relax, to express themselves if they're frustrated, to express themselves if they're fine. Uh, and I want to instill that as a teacher. So, mm. And then I try to take that to heart with myself. I do do Tai Chi and I do uh, meditation. Uh, to get ready, but not all the time. <laughs> Lately, I haven't been doing much of it. But, <laughs> uh, but he's off, man. That's okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm easy <laughs> off. But right now, I just came back from Peaks Island at Casco Bay. Took lots of pictures, and uh, that'll be my next inspiration. So, inspiration, family, nature, and Maine. That's mm. that mm. gives you confidence. Right. It gives you mm. confidence. I think when people think about art. Um, one of the things that they think about is well, the same thing I saw teaching at b both creative writing and a math teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. People feel like, well, I'm good at math. I'm not good. At, I'm not an artist. Or I'm an artist, but 
I can't do that math stuff. <laughs> People sort of start putting themselves into silos very early, even though we build these things. It's mm -hmm. all, you know, the mathematics and, yeah. and some paintings that are embedded into things, right? Yes. So, in other words, inspiration, yes, but it's still then a process, I guess. It's mm -hmm. work. You know, mm -hmm. I think people oh, feel yeah, like... a lot of work. <laughs> feel, <laughs> feel like, oh, you're an artist, you just you made your painting <laughs> and you go home, right? Or you yeah, wrote right. your poem, yeah, that's yeah, nice, yeah, that's you wrote a song. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that, that aspect of that? It is, it is a craft, I guess, is mm -hmm. the word I like yeah. with it. Yeah. I, well, well I, you know, I, the particular tension that I deal with, the choice that I've made, I think, in the field I work with, is political poetry, right? Uh, and the, and the, you walk a fine line between politics and art, right? I mean, if you're heavily involved in the politics, it'll oftentimes diminish the art. Mm -hmm. And if you're heavily involved in the art, oftentimes it'll dilute the, mm. the po political message, right? So Robert Bly wrote a wonderful book oh, about yes. this, right? Yes. About you know, poli yes. political poetry. You know, and, he, and he said, ultimately, it really is personal, mm -hmm. right? And, very, it, and if it works, it's, it has that personal approach to it. And it's not a diatribe and stuff like that. So that's the t tension I'm always working with. Am I being too heavily political in this, or am I being too heavily, you know, artistic in this, or what's going on? Um, and I wait for, as I and I think you guys have both alluded to, I wait for other people to respond to it, right? You know, and if they <laughs> respond the way I'm hoping they'll respond, then it works, right? If they don't, well, then okay, I've got to go back to this thing and see if I can recraft it, if you will. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. What's your process, Doug, when you get an idea, like you think I'm going to write about <laughs> ah, let me take a picture. something, ah. right? Um, it's, well, it, no, it, you know, actually, and I think it's Allen Ginsberg, one of my idols and my models, said, you know, uh, if a poem comes from the head, it's already dead in the water. Yeah. Okay, it's got to come from here. Piece yeah. of art, too, I yeah. think. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 uh, maybe it was Walt Whitman, one of those guys. Yeah. He basically said, you know, a poem starts in the gut. Maybe Frost, one of those guys. But, and it works its way up, and, and, and then finally into the mind, and then finally into the hands, right? Mm. You know, but if it starts here, forget it. So somebody said, why don't you write a poem about PTSD or something like that? <laughs> Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> rip that up. But when you're sitting around with a bunch of people who have PTSD, right, and I, I wrote a poem about this, and I remember I was staying in a hotel, and I got up at like 3 o'clock in the morning, walked into the bathroom, looked at this mirror, and I remembered these guys talking. These guys were on the verge of suicide, some of them. And I looked at a mirror, and I said, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> crack mm -hmm. that baby, and there mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the suicide right there. And that's the poem came out of that. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I structured it. I start writing, and what happens? I just start writing it, right? And then it starts structuring, and then I start mm. playing with it um, a little bit. But, but that's what I hear too. Is that so? There's there's moments, or there's things that will uh, I hear from most artists. There's something almost like that. You use the word tension, but there's something that just sticks you enough to say, yeah, I should I should keep working this, or I should keep finding that. Do you find that leads for yourself with your process? You talked about uh, meditation, but are there other things that you do to kind of work on your craft? Yeah. Um, well, I don't, like Frank was saying, I don't meditate as much before I paint a, anymore as much as I used to. But what I do do is I do a lot of deep breathing and mm. being inspired by something. Mm. I think that for me, color inspires me, light mm. inspires me. So I can be, I can go up to my room, my art room, and I see the light coming through the window in, in a very unusual way and maybe hitting something on the floor mm. or, and I just kind of stare at it for a while and sort of study it. Mm. And then I think about, because I've never been a, f I'm not formally trained. I've never taken any courses. I was thinking, boy, I'd love to take some classes mm -hmm. from you. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about that. But I've never been formally trained. So, so, but I think I'm a very visual person. I always have been. And I can look at something and tell mm -hmm. whether it works. You know, like, like when I decorate, you know, feng shui, right? Yep. When I yep. decorate a room... <laughs> And I look, I step back from it, almost like it's a, it's a painting. And I'll say, that works. Mm -hmm. Or, no, nope, I've got to move that chair a little bit to the yeah. left yeah. because it's off. It's not quite right. Mm -hmm. And I sort of do that with my paintings, even though they're all abstract. As I paint, as I'm in the process of putting the paint on the paper, and I do a lot of layering mm -hmm. with mine because acrylics, I think, lend themselves yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. And as I layer, things come out mm. 
of the painting. They emerge. When you're making something, it's not that you have an end goal necessarily, exactly. but you you are willing to go on a journey, but there's something there that's driving you somewhere. Is that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, the two E's, you know, you experience what you feel and what you see, and what you smell, and you, after that experience, you experiment. Mm. So those, uh, those are the really uh, things that I instill in myself and I try to instill that into all my students. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong about what you do. Mm. Right. You're experimenting and then you're experiencing all this. Plus, we do have a writing element to our, our artwork. Oh, every, yeah, every kid was <laughs> doing yeah. a haiku on, yeah. on their on, on artwork. And um, at first they hated it and then they loved it. Yeah. <laughs> because oh, if, they, if they said, if I don't express it just right, I could do it in my haiku. So it would just go oh, back and forth. That's yeah. a wonderful idea. That's yeah. a great so idea. So the haiku is, yeah. and I said, okay, it's 575 and you can't repeat the words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, shoot. I think, I think the one element that cuts across all art form is a sense of wonder. Mm. Right. I mean, as when you start mm. something, it's like you, you, like you said, there's no end game here. I'm not thinking. I'm, it's like I'm starting this thing, and all of a sudden, go, oh, I wonder where this is going to go. I wonder, I wonder, you know. And, that, and I think that's a key word. Yeah. You know, without being childish, I mean, I think we're you know we're Child adults who like, experience. Yeah. Maybe more. Yeah. Maybe. But yeah. We're, we're, we're adults who have experienced certain things, right? Yeah. And we can't pretend to be innocent children as much. But there is that sense of wonder that I think we share. Yeah. I get from from kids. I, I just have Absolutely, to and you know that the meditation, what it does for me is it puts me in the now, mm. right? I I because I tend to be a person. Oh, I'm worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm I'm oh, concerned yeah. about what I did yesterday, but instead to go right into the now, and mm. I think that art comes from that Absolutely. presence, mm. being present and being having that sense of wonder about what you're observing. Yeah. Um, it's that, such a beautiful a thing. What's a Buddhist tenet? Just this, just now? Just this, just, just now. Right this moment. Just, yeah. At this moment. That's all yeah. we've got. And at the essence. Yeah. Mm. Uh, how do you see art um, building community? Why, why is art important in terms of what it can do uh, for a community? Uh, this exhibit yourself, it's uh, part of what I, I like about exhibits is there's sort of an ephemeral essence to them that it's, all, you know, there's a showing, all those things, that each individual piece becomes this own other thing as an exhibit. Um, and it's something like you talked about, coming in and seeing other people, and especially coming out of COVID isolation. Yeah. And, um, oh, yeah. So uh, as, as you think about that, what is it about art that can help build stronger communities? Well, I, I just see it as a gathering. You know, when, mm. when, when you have even... A small exhibit. You're, you're you're creating a sense of gathering and community just right there. Right. Mm -hmm. So the gathering, I mean, with with the advertisement that they had. I mean, even without it, you you know, this sidewalk art shows. There's always a gathering there, mm -hmm. and, it, and, mm -hmm. and people gather. Again, it's difficult with COVID, and that that took a big hit. But I think it's uh, the gathering of people mm -hmm. that makes that sense of community. That makes the sense of wellness actually um, mm. out of all, the, all this and it made sense out of it too so yeah. that's that's my interpretation of it I, I think art and artists are, are purposefully vulnerable right and our culture is, dictates against that like you mentioned silos everybody's in their silos everybody protecting themselves everybody's going to set up have a judgment immediately going to judge something so that they can distance themselves from it whereas an artist is saying here i am you know i'm putting it out there for you Come and get it, right? You know, and I think people appreciate that stuff. And one more Robert Bly reference was I really like. <laughs> <laughs> You can't uh, avoid Robert Bly. Uh, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Robert Bly. But he said, you know, he said, if you went, if, if you went into a, an art gallery and there was a Van Gogh painting and then a perfect replica of that Van Gogh painting, he said, those of us who are tuned into art would go to the original because there, it's, he said it's like an electric charge. The artist is in there. Right, mm. and, and and if you're sensitive enough to the art form, there's going to be a connection there, right? You know, even though the the replica is perfectly well done and all that kind of stuff, there's still this energy that resides in the art form itself that people are attracted to. It's really interesting, and I and I like that. Idea. I like that too. And you know, I was thinking as you both were talking too that I think that art is thought of incorrectly as a very solitary 
Oh. And it is to a degree in that when you're doing your art, you are generally alone mm. um, and generally, you know, kind of communing, if you will, with with your piece. I mean, I can be up in my art room for hours and hours and lose track of time. Mm. And um, but being this is the first time I've been in an exhibit. Wow. I've had it this is the, the very last. first wow, time. Really? So I and I've had my my stuff hanging at home and people will come into our house and they'll say, "Oh, is that your, you know, who who did those, you know?" Is that a Van Gogh? Is that is that a, you know, Picasso? No. <laughs> Gosh, no. Um, but um, so being an exhibit um, you, like you said, you got to put yourself out there, yeah. right? You got to say, you know, I'm going to really put myself out there. And one really interesting thing that happened for me, I used to hang all my work on the same wall. When I take it home, I'm not going to do that. Uh -huh. I'm going to spread it out. Uh -huh. Good for you. Because what I realized is my work at this exhibit was uh -huh. spread out, which was, and I, I first asked, I said, Ooh, is there something wrong with my stuff? <laughs> they didn't put it all together like a lot of other people. <laughs> and they said, no, no, it just worked out that way. Yeah, it right. just felt right to have the, they did a beautiful job, Emery and, and the people at Gold Leaf did such a great job of hanging. But when I take it home, I'm going to hang each piece yep. by itself so that when people come in, because I think they were kind of almost overwhelmed by it's like wow you got a lot going on here <laughs> yeah. so that's the sense of community too having people mm -hmm. come and see your work respond to it then it makes you grow as a person mm -hmm. and change mm -hmm. and uh, it's been a great experience for me well this has been a great experience for me as well and i really appreciate you all coming in at as you just said, to share not only your art in an exhibit like this, I think these are really important things in our community um, for people to, to access and see, but then to also talk a little bit about your personal experience at being artists. So I appreciate you all, all coming on today and, uh, and sharing with us. Thank you, Thank you for it's the a pleasure. Thank you. Hi, my name is Frank Chin. I'm a graphic artist, uh, printmaker. And I just want to briefly give you an idea of my process. This is called a monotype, and monotype is one of a kind. That means you print something, and it's, all, it's unique, and you can't reproduce the same exact uh, kind again, uh, as opposed to a monoprint. A monoprint can be reproduced several times the same way. This is a monotype. It's one of a kind. And I use these images. I use uh, a, a plexiglass plate. I roll ink on the plexiglass plate and then I cut out Mylar stencils and I ink this up and when I ink it up I put it on the plate and then the paper over it and I run it through a press and that's how I get this is a simplification of it but this is the process plate stencil ink and roll onto an etching press these are my stencils that I use to create the images. Uh, these are Mylar stencils. It's colored on both sides, rolled ink or hand painted. And once it's inked up, uh, I roll it through the press several times. The reason why I do it several times is so that uh, I get a ghost image. The ghost image is so that creates foreground, middle ground, background. These are the ghost images. That means I printed it once and lifted up and it's embedded onto the plate. And once the plate is on there, the image is already set and I can re-ink it again and re-roll it. The next process I have is called a monotype shinkole. Monotype shinkole, same thing. You have a stencil, you paint the stencil, you put it on a plexiglass plate. This is the stencil for the bird. I paint both sides with etching ink. The etching ink is, the, the reason why I paint both sides is so that uh, I'll have an image on paper and an image on the plexiglass. It embeds an image on the plexiglass. And once that happens, I print it on the paper and then on the plexiglass, and that gives you a ghost image. This is done with a shinkole. These, if you can see it closely, uh, 
uh, uh, dried leaves. At the time, it was, it was uh, wet, and I painted the leaves. And then here, you see this ooze of paint here? Well, that's from berries, uh, blueberries from uh, um, on my property. And then some, some of the found objects on Peaks Island. So I, I look at the uh, natural environment and use some of the pieces to put on my work. Once I do that, the Schinkele method is that you sprinkle wheat paste on the paper. It's a damp paper and then you have the plexiglass which is the plate and you can see that embossing here. That's a large plate. The plate is on there and the Schinkele is on the plate. I arrange it and then spray water and dampen it and then sprinkle wheat paste onto the paper and I put it onto the press and I roll it through the etching press and slowly you lift it up and the because there's on the etching press there's 2,200 pounds per pressure per square inch on that it it mats it down it squeezes everything on there flatten it and squeezes whatever juices there are as color this is the same process, only I use watercolors to uh, complete the process. This is the background or foreground that I use to create sort of like the sand on a beach. And I have these three kids uh, experimenting with water and playing, which you see all the time uh, on the beach. It also, because of the etching press, uh, when you, because of the, depending on the size, the thickness of the stencil, it embosses your work too. I don't know if you can see that, but it embosses. So you probably see it better in the back. See all that? You can't do that by hand. You have to do it with the press. <laughs> let, let me show you the plexiglass and some of the colors I didn't take out. And some of the colors here, so you put the plexiglass on here, your stencil colored, uh, let's say some for contrast. I have this one in the distance over here, like that. I roll the ink with a big roller or a small roller, and that's all inked up. And then I I hand paint or I the horse both sides, and then I hand paint this both sides. I put a piece of plain paper on top of it, felt blankets on top to cushion, and a newsprint to absorb any colors that so it won't get on the blanket. Roll it through the press, lift up carefully, see if you register it right, and you'll have a print of that on here. But that's, that's only the artist proof, that's not the finished product. I then, because I inked both sides, I lift this up and you will have an embedded image of the horse and the cow here. But it's light and when you lift up, because there's 2,200 pounds per square inch of pressure, you, it creates a suction. And when that suction is lifted, you will create something like this onto the plate that is embedded to the plate and that is the artist's uh, final print which uh, had two plates. When you lift it up you get this. Once I have this finished, these two images were not here. What I did was I printed color here and printed it on here and I rolled it through the press. That gives me a darker image and then I take that out and then I roll ink again and put another one that gives me the, the background, foreground, middle ground, and contrast. So uh, ghost images is key to my success on creating these kinds of various textures which uh, cannot be created by hand. It's got to be done with the press. The same thing with these trees that are on the back. These, when you, when you lift it up, it creates a suction. These are for, you know, just watercolor straight up, nothing, uh, you know, no stencil or anything, just uh, drawing, free colors and 
This I'd done with a photograph that was in Rockland. They were in the distance and I took a picture. <laughs> It was just a watercolor. I pencil everything in and then I color the watercolor on top of that. That was one of the classes I was teaching. And I, and I was, it's the, one of the best ways to teach is when you do your own work, everybody looks at it and they see your technique and then you go back and they copy your technique. So it's, it's just good. <laughs> you know, wash. Uh, remember to leave white on the paper. It will give you the sense of light. And that's the hottest thing. Everybody wants to paint over it. but. Right here, you, know, you decide where the light is, don't paint it. <laughs> don't paint it, look at, I mean, that, that gives you the sense of the sun is beaming right at them. You want not the sense of, uh, you know, a composition. The composition has to have light to bring it out. If you don't have that, like, I love the light beaming down. That gives you different colors when the light beams down on a tree or on a person. Without the light, you have to use your imagination and decide, oh, what kind of color. It it's easy to use nature as a light source to give you that wonderful sense of color. These is just by an experience. This is just experience. Uh, this is not live painting. I mean, although I took pictures of my son dancing, um, the light, you, you just can't mimic that. So I have to use imagination for this. Was, I had another one. I have five versions of these. Um, one little girl was walking away because this boy poured water on her. And my, my title was, I'm telling mommy. <laughs> it was, that's, that was wonderful. That sold. The, but, you know, there was a little girl here. These figures were huge. They were about from here to here. And they were playing in the sand and <laughs> in the water and this boy poured a little bit of water on it and I captured that picture and the little girl was walking and oh, I'm telling mom, <laughs> it's just great. I mean, even if you reproduce it, you, you, <laughs> I mean, these are raised. Right. You know, they, they're, taking a picture like I have my website, it doesn't do it justice. You, you really can't see, even if I do a detail of it, you can't see the whole picture of it, really. Uh, so. Uh, yes, my, my son is a computer engineer. He said, I could do that easily. Yeah, but you can't touch it. You can't feel the organic material on it. He's good, but ain't that good. <laughs>